Welcome everybody to the Investors Podcast 2.0, Wealth Mindset, where we dive into the minds of the successful real estate entrepreneur to uncover the tips and tricks that have allowed them to keep moving forward. I am your host, Scott Bauer, and I'm excited that you're here with us. Welcome back, everybody. It is another episode of the Invest This Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bauer. And once again, I'm excited to be here. Really excited to be here because we're going to talk about something that we can all relate to, which is uh, saving on some taxes, taxes and taxes and more taxes. Exciting times. We got uh, Brett Swartz here. He's the CEO of Capital Gains Tax Solutions. Um, and I'm going to let him kind of dive in a little bit more on what exactly that is and a little bit about his background and kind of what he's focused on now. So, Brett, welcome to the call, man. How are you? Hey, Scott, I'm doing great. I'm pleasure to be here and add some value to you and your audience. Good deal. Good deal. So walk us through it. Um, I mean, what is Capital Gains Tax Solutions and, and what exactly are you helping people do with that? Yeah, so most high net worth individuals, especially those who own commercial real estate, a high end primary home or a business, you know, they struggle with capital gains tax and it's somewhere between 30 and 50 percent of their gain when they go to sell. And we use a deferred sales trust to give them tax deferral, liquidity, and diversification, and the ability to eliminate the need for the 1031 exchange once and for all so they can create and preserve more wealth. So Capital Gains Tax Solutions, um, we are a third-party unrelated trustee that provides this service to perfect this strategy. We are an exclusive trustee for the Deferred Sales Trust. And uh, yeah, we can't wait to, uh, to, uh, to unlock the secret for all the listeners right now. I like it. I like it. Well, let's, let's get started. I mean, how did you get started into this? What, what got you into, you know, obviously, not obviously, I, I must tell the listeners, he was in commercial real estate. He's done, what is it, 85 million in close tra commercial transactions. Is that right? Correct. Um, you know, he, he's been around the game for a while. And so I'm guessing that's kind of how he got started, figuring out that there was a there was a need and, and you know, this was a spot where he could start a business around it. But walk us through that a little bit. I mean, how where did you really find that this was an area where you could excel at and help people? Yeah, so my story starts in the real estate game at in Marcus and Millichap, a real estate investment firm in Northern California, where I was a commercial real estate broker helping people buy and sell mainly multifamily apartments here in the Sacramento area. And uh, it was 2006 and things were going really well. You know, it kind of reminds me of pre-COVID here. Prices were high, rents were growing, everything was doing very, very good. And then all of a sudden something happened, right? Uh, the crash. But even before that, I was brand new to the game and I was just trying to survive in the business. You know, I was newly married, I had a daughter at home and I was, you know, as a commercial real estate broker, you either sink or swim, either you make a big check or you make zero. There's no salary, there's no benefits. And, but I love the business and I was, I was, uh, I was just trying to make it and I was making a little bit and I was getting going, but I don't know if you've ever been so scared, Scott, where you barely made any money and you're not sure how you're going to support your family, but that's where I was. It wasn't always easy. You know, I, it was, it was a struggle and people are telling me, go get a real job. What are you doing? And I just started to get some momentum going in the business and then 2008 hit. And then it really became like, oh my gosh, do you love this business or are you going to go, you know, get a real job as, as a lot of my friends would say, right? And I said, you know, I love the business. I'm going to figure out a way to do it. So I did what every good entrepreneur does. And I actually went and got a side job at a restaurant, Cheesecake Factory, serving cheesecake uh, uh, nights. And by days, I'd be, I would call and help owners get out of um, uh, or figure out a way to lower their tax rate based upon new property values from things that just completely hit the wall, help them negotiate with banks, help them get concessions with the rents, with the renters, help them do anything they can to keep them, keep them going. Because not only was I going through this struggle financially, but they were going through something that was very uh, stressful too. They were losing half of their wealth. Some of them lost everything during this crash. And so we try to figure out how do we add value to clients and how do we help them escape feeling trapped by capital gains tax. And what we found out as we did our research was people had done 1031 exchanges and they had overpaid for properties, right? They had sold high and bought higher 180 days later. And they had taken on massive amount of debt. And then when the music stopped, they were left with values that were lower than what they owed for some of them or, cl or close to it or cash flow that was, that was um, unpredictable, right, with people losing their jobs. And so they were losing everything. So we said, there's got to be a better way. And I don't know if you've ever had someone come into your life that teaches you something that opens up a whole nother, what they call a blue ocean opportunity, but that's exactly what happened to me. My manager at Marcus and Millichap at the time brought in a gentleman, this is about 2009, to speak on what's called the Deferred Sales Trust. And at that point, 
we understood that now we can help people escape the capital gains tax, the 1031 exchange forever, so they never have to feel forced to overpay for a property, never have to face have, having to take on too much debt. And so the plan was this. I was going to roll it out to my clients. I was going to grow my business, and I was going to help a lot of people um, and, be, and become like, you know, the top broker uh, at doing this. And so that's what I started to do. I started to roll it out. My business started to grow, and my value started to grow because I was giving them something that no one else had. And I like to, to, to liken this to Blockbuster versus Netflix. The Blockbuster is like the old 1031 exchange. Right. Very restrictive. 45 days to identify, 180 days to close equal or greater value, have to stay in the same asset class type, right? Yep. I love commercial real estate, but I also love it when the prices are, are, are more of a buyer's market, which we think we're going to move into. Well, that's the old way of doing things. The new way is the deferred sales trust. It's like Netflix, right? You can, you can, you can buy whenever you want to. You can be passive or active. You can put it into multiple asset types. You can put it in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, or real estate, or a new business venture, or developing real estate. You don't have to do equal or greater value. You don't have to take on any debt if you don't want to. You get a brand new depreciation schedule. And as soon as I understood that, everything changed. And fast forward, five kids now, my wife and I have been able to be um, full-time. Uh, first was commercial real estate broker, then it would transition to training brokers, training financial advisors, training commercial real estate operators, luxury realtors on how to use this strategy so they can grow their business and or if you're the client listening to this so that you can escape feeling trapped by capital gains tax. So the old way for the listeners, I mean, if you're going to do a 1031 exchange, you basically have 180 days to make that transaction happen. Instead of doing that, you're putting a trust together, in which case you put the capital gains within that trust and it sits there in a protected, a protected, uh, you know, I guess trust, right? And you can use that at your leisure. Explain that a little bit. Why would somebody obviously, you know, I mean, it's kind of obvious why somebody would want to do that, but why is a 1031 still around if that's the case? Why doesn't everybody do this? Yeah, great question. So um, it's the best kept secret. We call it the three secrets to an optimal timing transformational exit plan. And the first one is secret number one, selling and deferring hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars in capital gains tax, how to legally break free from capital gains tax and find freedom to buy and sell your business or property without ever worrying about a 1031 exchange ever again. Okay, so that's a big statement there. Realize, yeah. first of all, the 1031 only works for investment property does not work for primary homes, does not work for stocks, does not work for um, most of the time for carried interest because most syndicators are just selling their property and exiting and just paying the tax. Okay, uh, it, it, it's very, it doesn't work for cryptocurrency. The Deferred Sales Trust works for all those asset types, okay? But if you are in investment real estate, um, you can do a 1031 exchange, right? Um, but you've never heard of the Deferred Sales Trust, so you gotta figure out why use it? Why not use it? Well, the first thing you have to do is just cr just envision your wealth plan, right, Scott? And say, draw a line down the middle and say, here's my vision and what's going to help me get there. There's the 1031 route and there's the deferred sales trust route. And I like to use actual deal stories. And so one of the most prolific ones was in 2006. And this gentleman saw the writing on the wall. Prices were very high. He, he's worth um, a, a large amount of money. He was selling a $20 million asset in Minnesota. And he sold at the peak and he looked around and he said, these 1031 exchanges don't make any sense. And instead of paying the tax, he moved it to the deferred sales trust. And five years later, all tax deferred, he bought his same property back at 60 cents on the dollar. So he sold high and he bought low, right? Simple as that. So if you want to sell high and buy low, you have, a t you have a deferred sales trust. If you want to sell high and often pay a higher 180 days later, you can use the 1031. But, but a lot of people are stuck in commercial real estate because commercial real estate is like a religion. And I love the religion of commercial real estate. I love cash flow. I love multifamily. I love value add. I love syndications. I love the depreciation, right? You can offset. It's the best hands down risk adjusted rate of return, multifamily, mobile home park, senior housing, in my opinion. But that being said, it's not always a good time to buy real estate, right? And right. so you got to weigh the options. And so if you want optimal timing is what we call it, uh, then use the deferred sales trust. If you want to get stuck and pressured, use the 1031. So in our book, you would never use a 1031 ever again unless you're in a buyer's market, unless you can find that deal that makes sense. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, it definitely does answer my question. And I think the next kind of follow-up question is we're seeing a lot of similarities 2006 to what we're seeing today, right? The marketplace is a little bit different. The economics are a little bit different. You know, not quite the same reasons why uh, things are inflated as they are from 2006 to today, but there's a lot of similarities. And we actually see that same thing where somebody might sell 
an asset today and the only option that they have is to go buy another asset that's more expensive that you know doesn't really give you it's it's not a smart move and so in some areas i know some operators that have not just have chosen to just sit on the sideline or continue to you know operate their existing asset because they don't they know that they don't have any other options so i mean how, how do you how do you feel about that what do you see i mean are you seeing the same thing is it is it is it why you're really pushing for this type of uh you know tax gain or i guess tax savings rather solution yeah yeah for the solution yeah yeah i'll get i'll tell you a recent deal we just closed this is post COVID or pre-covid he sold 128 units in georgia okay, okay. athens georgia okay. and he's bought and sold hundreds of properties over 30 years he's a commercial real estate operator owner um really expert and he was faced with looking at cap rates at four and a half and five percent in north carolina and he's going why am i going to trade and overpay in this 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 short time period he sold his property for 7.6 million and he goes i don't really want to buy this but i'm not sure he's sitting with the qi company 45 days pass and then guess what hits COVID 19 and they can and it just kind of starts to collapse and he's like okay now i'm definitely not doing a 1031 i'm not touching real estate for maybe 6 12 you know 18 months depending on how this thing shakes out so for the first time he used a deferred sales trust so we saved his failed 1031 exchange okay and he put the money into uh uh the bank he paid off all of his debts so the number one reason for him was he wanted to be out of debt he wanted to be liquid he wanted to get the powder dry for when the market shifts and so he put 3.1 million into the deferred sales trust, paid off all of his debt. He didn't have to do equal or greater value or replace any debt. And now from there, he actually put it into some hard money lending, some short term stuff with an op experienced operator. And then he just recently put 2 million into a multifamily fund where they're gonna be buying distressed multifamily over the next six, 12, 24 months, okay? So for him, his reasons were very clear. He wanted diversification. He wanted to be out of debt. He wanted liquidity. He wanted tax deferral, and he also wanted to be passive. He was—he's a baby boomer. He doesn't want to be tired. Uh, he doesn't want to be tied down with the toilets, the trash, the liability. He wants to get over to a younger generation, uh, people who have experience and who are doing that full time. He wants to spend time with his grandkids and travel and do some other philanthropy work. Okay? He doesn't want to be involved with all of the debt and all of the stuff. He already went through the 08 crash. Like he doesn't want to do it all over again. And so that was the, that was a reason for him. Everyone's a little bit different. Um, um, and so you really got to look at what do you think is going to happen and how do you position yourself for your wealth plan to be able to uh, lower your risk, okay, and be able to, to capture values and buy deals uh, when it makes sense for you. So I'm not sure if that quite answers your question, but hopefully it does. Well, I mean, I think you're, you know, you brought up other questions, right? And I'm sure the listeners have lots of questions as, as both you and I are talking that the things are coming to mind, right? One of the things that, where's the catch? You know, what, is there an SEC guideline? Is there a tax code guideline? Is there something that says that, you know, any restrictions on this type of plan? Yeah, so what's the catch? Um, well, the first thing you got to ask yourself is, is it legal, right? Is it legal? Is there any reason why I should be concerned that if I do this, I'm going to have to pay the tax? And so that's where if anyone comes to you with a brand new tax referral strategy, such as the Deferred Sales Trust, um, there's one called the Monetized Installment Sale. Uh, there's other kind of uh, copycats that are similar to us out there. You got to ask yourself a number of questions. A, what's the IRC tax code? The IRC tax code is IRC 453. It's known as an installment sale. It goes back to the 1920s. You and Scott and I know about, and your listeners know, as a seller carry back. We can just carry paper on a property. So if you had a $10 million property that had a zero basis, Scott, and you owned it free and clear, and you were to pay $4 million in tax, you might say, you know what? I don't want to do that. I'll carry paper for somebody. So if okay. I give you a $2 million down payment, you can carry paper. You only pay tax on the two. On the other eight, it's in a deferral state. But likewise, I could also give you a zero down payment and you can carry the full 10 million. In that scenario, you owe zero tax today. It's in a deferral state. And that's what we do with the deferred sales trust. We just have it buy your position for 10 million, give you a zero down payment, ask you to carry the full paper and we get the full cash buyer over there to fund the trust itself. So that being said, that's the tax code. That's the foundation. The second question you want to ask is, well, how many of these have actually been done? Like, I haven't heard of this. My CPA hasn't told me about it. Well, thousands of closes. Oh, really? For how long? Over 25 years. Oh, okay. Well, uh, how much under management? Billions under management. Oh, wow. Uh, what's the biggest deal? A $125 million deal in San Diego. Oh, does it work for businesses? Yeah, I just did a $2.6 million deal in Alabama. 
Oh, does it work for car dealerships? Yeah, there's an $80 million car dealership done. Oh, does it work for veterinarians, optometrists, dentists? Yep, we've done all of those. Huh, so really smart people over 25 years, thousands of closes, every different walk of life and every different type of asset, highly appreciated public stock. Yeah, $5 million for Netflix. Okay, so they've all done that. What about national law firms? Have they reviewed it? Yeah, they've reviewed it. Have they joined you? Yeah, a lot of them have. What about other CPAs? Yep. What about financial advisors? We have thousands of financial advisors that offer this now. Okay, but more than all of that, how about the IRS? How many IRS audits have you had? Well, we've had about 15, and they're all no-change audits. Okay, no change, what does that mean? I mean, not one single issue with the IRS. Thousands of closes, tens of thousands of tax returns. And so the catch would be, is it legal, right? And do the attorneys stand behind their work? Or in other words, are they gonna set me up with something and then just leave me out to dry? Well, for the Deferred Sales Trust, we have what's called audit defense built in for every single deal, meaning no additional charge. The tax attorneys will represent you all, all, and they, um, uh, with no additional charge. That's pretty sweet. The next one would be, well, are the funds protected? Yeah, the funds never move without your signature. They're held at some of the largest banks in the world. TD Ameritrade is the main one. They just bought Charles Schwab. You have 24 seven access to view the funds. And so as you get to meet us and understand why it's legal, why it works, talk with our, our clients who have closed it, you quickly become to say, okay, well then why don't I know about it? Well, your commercial real estate broker doesn't want you to know about it, why? He wants to keep you in the 1031 chase, chasing more deals, taking in all more debt because he gets big commissions. I get it, I'm a commercial real estate broker, right? I, I, I love doing 1031s because I know it's pretty much a, a slam dunk for the commission. Amen. But I hate it doing 1031s when people are overpaying. And I hated having my, my, my clients in the place of feeling trapped and, and having to make a poor financial decision under a short amount of time. And so this is where, as a commercial real estate broker, we train, we train brokers on how to add value beyond the 1031. And we have experttaxsecrets.com for that. But more so for the client, how to break free from the capital gains tax with the 1031 exchange. So uh, I'll pause there. I know I said a whole lot and you might have some questions. Well, I mean, yeah, there, there's of course a ton of questions that go into that, but my other question that comes to my mind right, right away is if my money's sitting in a, in, a, in a tax shelter or it's sitting in a spot, it's not making any money. I get no depreciation. I get no nothing. It's just dead money. It's sitting there and it's ready to go when I want to deploy it. But if it's sitting there for five years, that's five years worth of tax deferment I didn't get or tax depreciation I didn't get, or, you know, that money's just sitting there and dead money. What do you have to talk about that? Is that a problem that you can deal with? Yeah, it's, it's, it's even better than you think. And here it is. This is my number one wealth building hack. It's my secret number three to all of this, right? How to get your deferred sales trust to work in your favor okay. and become an, an investment rather than an expense, okay? And I'm going to talk about some of the money managers that help us to manage these funds, okay? And one of them is called um, SEI, and they manage for the Major League Baseball and Mercedes-Benz pension funds. They're some of the best, smartest financial advisors in the world and they're uh they're a part of our inner circle also uh there's five guys at pimpco that ran pimp and helped help take pimpco and pimpco for those who are is one of the biggest money managers in the world from i think it was 90 billion to 1.2 trillion they retired and then four of the five are now a part of the inner circle for the deferred sales trust money um risk risk uh management uh financial um uh, advisory team okay so first of all we have some of the best and the smartest that oversee this but listening to uh to this podcast and like me i'm not a big stock guy and i'm imagining a lot of your listeners aren't either they're like commercial real estate people right, right. and and so so am i so this is the key this is the plan scott sell high park it in the trust let's earn some conservative returns and some investment grade securities okay conservative stuff in fact we have a group called swan and swan in 2008 the market was down 37 to 40 percent they were only down four and a half percent. Did you see the movie, The Big Short before? Of course, of course, yes. The Big Short, they shorted the mortgage-backed securities and they made a killing, right? Well, Swan has a similar model where they hedge and they short the market by buying these put options. And that's what they do. So we like to say is sell high, park it on the sidelines, protect it, make a small return, and then let all of the sharks feed in the, in the frenzy, the <coughs> seller's frenzy, the high marketplace, all the blood in the water. And then when the smoke clears, then you come back in through your deferred sales trust, and this is how we do it. We form an LLC, you're the managing member of it, and it's like a self-directed IRA. You can direct the funds into this LLC, now you can buy real estate, but here's the key, all tax deferred, no timing restrictions. And so let's say you would've bought a $10 million deal, but now it's worth nine, right? Because you waited a year or two. So now you just saved a million dollars, right? Versus doing the 1031, 
So that's the first thing. Two, you got a brand new depreciation schedule. Okay, right. so one of the number one reasons to own investment real estate is for the depreciation to offset the income. So if you own multifamily for 27 and a half years, it goes to zero. That's a problem because if you do a 1031, that old depreciation schedule travels. So the intent is to get a brand new depreciation schedule. The challenge is the 1031 doesn't allow that, but the deferred sales trust does. We're not using 1031, we're using IRC 453. Therefore, when you buy that new property with that LLC, you get a brand new depreciation schedule, of which you say, well, Brett, can I do cost segregation on that? And I say, absolutely, you can do cost segregation on that. And now you've just made this an investment rather than an expense. You follow me so far, Scott? I am. I very much am. I'm quite, I'm, I'm curious on, does it have the same rules and regulations that an IRA would, you know, in that same, you know, because it sounds very similar to it. Why would somebody want to park their money in an IRA when they could just put it in a trust like this? Operates exactly, very similar. Yeah. Yeah, so this is not a retirement account, but it's similar. It's oh. kind of like a SEP IRA. It's kind of okay. like a self-directed IRA. It's kind of like a 1031. It's kind of like a lot of these things, right? But it's its own deferred sales trust. So there's no, you know, there's no restrictions as far as age. You know, there's no like, you can only put so much in per year. We have none of that other stuff, right? And now when do you pay the tax? Well, when you receive income from the trust, you'll pay the tax. And most of our notes are structured as 10-year notes because realize you're becoming the lender, remember. You're basically becoming a secured lender and this trust owes you 100% of the money. Okay, so you're taking off your ownership hat and you're putting on a lender hat. Although when you direct it to an LLC, you're back in the ownership hat again and you're buying that real estate with a new depreciation schedule, all tax deferred, and then you can sell that deal and roll it all back into the mothership. So imagine you have, you have 20 houses or 20 properties or, or 20 different assets. You can slowly sell one at a time and just park it into the trust and you get multiple notes and you just keep compiling up your money and then you can use that one up to 80% of it to go get a brand new, to go get a, to put in a down payment and get a brand new deal. We need to keep 20% liquid. Okay. All that being said, it's like riding the bike for the first time. You've never rode this bike, right? right. And your head's probably spinning and it feels like a fire hose right now. We've done thousands of these and we will guide you through this. And just like the first time you did a 1031, and you, you, you weren't very comfortable with it. You didn't really know. You got your CPA and the QI right. company and your broker to help you through the first one. Same thing. That's what we're going to do for you. Except we've done 1031s. We've done Delaware Statutory Trust. By the way, this is not a Delaware Statutory Trust. This is a deferred sales trust. A Delaware is just another form of a 1031. Don't get them confused, okay? We've done all of them, and we're going to help you clarify what the best option is for you. And by the way, sometimes it might be a partial Delaware and a partial deferred sales trust or a partial 1031. We just did a 5,000 acre deal in Texas. They sold for uh, 3,000 acres. They sold for 5 million and they did a partial 1031 and a partial deferred sales trust. Okay. They could, they found a deal for like 1.6 that made sense and they bought that one and they put the rest into the deferred sales trust. And that's a key too. It's not always, it doesn't have to be a hundred percent deferred sales trust. It could be a mixture of, of, an, uh, of each strategy. Is it legal and applicable in every state? Correct. Yeah. United States. Yes. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, there, I have a lot of questions. I can't really pinpoint exactly where to go because I don't understand why I've never heard of this before, you know, and probably a lot of listeners are, are curious on why they've never heard of that before either. You know, I mean, why is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so actually we just had Kevin Harrington on from Shark Tank, if you know who he is, with Mark Cuban, yeah. and, and he had never heard of it either. And uh, he sells highly appreciated stock. And he's saying, wait, Brett, if you're saying you have a way to do this, we're, we're doing publicly stock sales and we're paying millions of dollars of tax. He goes, you're going to be part of my dream team and we're, we're going to check it out. So regardless if you've heard of it, realize that we want you to do your due diligence and get, get to know us. And so bring in your trusted advisors, bring in your tax attorney, bring in your CPA, whomever, right? We've done deals with Marcus and Milichap, with Keller Williams, with every single title company. We have qualified intermediaries that are with us. We have, we have thousands of business professionals that have joined us. And so, um, uh, get with us and, and, and ask us the tough questions. Talk to, our, talk to our, our, our CPAs and tax attorneys and bring them in. It's proprietary, it's protected. Realize there's basically, uh, we don't have 5,000 companies out there offering this. Right. It's, it's not just the structure, it's the team of professionals to execute the business plan. And that's what we provide. I'm kind of like the anesthesiologist. I'm gonna make sure everything's okay and the brain surgeons are the ones gonna perform the surgery. Those are the CPAs and tax attorneys. But just realize no patients ever die on the surgery table and no patient's gone to jail. 
and we have a perfect track record with the IRS, but it does take executing this plan. By the way, for those listening right now, that means uh, our minimum deal is basically a million dollars, okay? So for anything that's smaller, it's too small. Our fees eat up the savings. You also need at least about $500,000 of gain. If you have that gain, then, then the numbers make sense mathematically for our fees and the tax deferral. Also, also depends on what state you're living in and what depreciation you've received. But realize it does. it is definitely for, for higher net worth individuals and bigger deals, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it, ha it, would, it almost have to. So if somebody has a, a culmination of, let's say, you know, a portfolio of 20, I mean, 25, 30, 50 single family houses, and they add up to over a million dollars worth of value, right? That would be the option for them. Somebody out there, right? Yes. 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 Why would somebody not want to do this? You know, why would somebody say, nah, you know, Brett, this just doesn't sound like it for me. I mean, has that ever happened where somebody, you've had a client or somebody come in and you go through the due diligence phase and they say, nah, not, not for me. Why would they do that? Yeah. Why would someone say no to the deferred sales trust? The, ans the answer is your deal is too small, right? So the math just doesn't work. Again, you're selling a deal for, 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 for 500,000, you're paying debt. And now you have 300,000 and you're saving 50,000 in tax. It's just too small. It's going to eat up the savings. So that's the first thing. If the math doesn't work, it doesn't work. You just say no right away. The yep. second one would be my CPA has never heard of it. And therefore I'm afraid that it's not legal or something's being pulled over my eyes. And so they're just so beholden to trusting the old way of blockbuster. Like they just want to go to Blockbuster and, and show up. And you remember driving there and you show up and you walk in and hopefully your movie was there. And then if you got it, you, hopefully it was rewound. And then, but even if it wasn't, you have to return it within three days. And you, like, they're just, they're just married to that old way of doing things. And so is the old, old folks who helped them with it. Right. And by old, I mean, they're traditional in their thinking. Right. Whereas the deferred sales trust is like Netflix and yeah, there's some ongoing fees and that's a difference. It's not just a one-time fee, like a, like a 1031. So that's how we get paid. We get ongoing recurring fees and we can talk about that right now. Essentially it's about 1.5% to set up your trust one time to the closing for the tax attorney and then 1.5 ongoing recurring with the financial advisor and the trustee. Okay. But if we saved you $400,000 of tax on a million dollar deal, got you a new depreciation schedule, give you a chance to buy stuff at a discount. Or for some of our clients, they just want to be out of the toilets, the trash, the liability. Like Peter, Peter is a client of mine. He sold a $1.8 million multifamily property. He's a baby boomer. And he was getting tired of driving from one, uh, from three hours to Sacramento and back two days a week, trying to collect rents. It was a nightmare. He had all this debt and all this liability. And he goes, Brett, I have 18 problems right now. I have 18 problems. And I said, well, why don't you do a 1031? He goes, well, I don't want 36 problems. I already have 18 problems. Why do I want 36? I want zero problems. So he put it all into securities, completely passive, out of debt. Why? So he could have more time and energy and less stress. So the other side would be, you don't mind getting your hands dirty. You don't mind staying in real estate. You don't mind you know, adding value. And by the way, if you can add value and build wealth, we're going to cheer you on. But we just don't want you to overpay. We want to do it on your terms and your timing. So the answer to your question is, if you find a deal that makes sense, go ahead and do a 1031. But remember, 1031 only applies to investment real estate, not private practices, not stocks, not cryptocurrency, not a primary home. We're doing a horse deal out of Kentucky right now. I don't know if you can know this, but you can't 1031 a horse. But like Seabiscuit, <laughs> you can buy a horse. Check this out, Scott. You can train the horse and you can sell it for a million dollar gain. Well, you can't 1031 a horse, but you can deferred sales trust a horse. And the deferred sales trust works for all of these. So hopefully that answers your question, but those are probably the biggest ones. They just can't, they can't get away from their own trusted advisors not knowing about it. And their trusted advisors don't necessarily want to say yes because they kind of are A, they're embarrassed because they don't know, or B, they have no upside. Like if they say yes to it and it doesn't work, then they're kind of on the hook. So they'd rather just say no, or I wouldn't do it but they're also not the one paying all the tax. What often happens though, if they actually do their due diligence and they actually get them to the table to talk about it, they almost 99% of the time say yes. But it's the ones that just like, don't want to sign an NDA or don't even want to talk about it. And, and then we go, well, you lost anyway. So you're going to pay the tax. So you just, you just laid down, but we've done thousands of them. We know it's hundred percent legal. Um, but it's your money. Someone needs to pay down the $25 trillion. And if you want to be a good American to do that, we just don't want it to be any of our clients. <laughs> well, I think it, it actually opens up a lot of opportunities for a lot of people that, that, you know, aren't limited by the restrictions that a 1031 gives you. Right. I like also how you can put it into the trust that you can turn around you can, you can loan out of it. Right. So you can put your money there. It's a safe haven basically where you can hard money loan out. You can, 
um, probably buy and sell notes out of it as well, right? I mean, it's kind of like an investment vehicle that you can that you can work out of, which is really really yes, nice. Absolutely, um, diversification. That's the key there, right? Diversification. You're not just all in one single asset type. Remember, 1031s. You're typically trading one, let's say, 20 unit apartment complex in the same town, same city for maybe 40 units, right? Just with more debt, and you're not necessarily diversified. Yeah, you got 40 tenants instead of 20. But why not put it into stocks like Netflix or Costco or, or, um, or you know, uh, other things uh, that are secure, that are liquid, that are diversified and hard money lending and or go with like Scott. Scott, we just talked about a deal that you have that you bought at 2.4 million, put a million into it, 128 units and almost get 815 rents. Why don't you put $500,000 with Scott on that deal? OK, so you're not just stuck in California or New York or these highly appreciated states trying to trade in the town that you know of, diversify it with multiple syndicators, okay? That's what my client's doing. He's putting some with Ashcroft Capital. He's putting some with Brian Burke and Praxis Capital. And he's doing multiple product types and multiple locations with multiple syndicators to diversify, if that makes sense. Absolutely. I love that you brought up Joe Fairless. He's such a great guy. He was actually how I got started in the multifamily space. Joe's mm -hmm. a great, great guy. Um, anyways, yeah, you know, it's an exciting thing. I, I'm, I'm glad with what you're doing. I think it's opening people's eyes to the new world of technology and the new world of looking at things, right? This is how things evolve. Commercial real estate is one of those things that I noticed when I first started in real estate, kind of started in more on the commercial side. People are very old school, right? It, it's like the old school way of thinking, the old school way of doing things, and they need a new uh, younger breed of people to go and, and reinvent the wheel type of thing. And so that's kind of what you're doing here. But let me pause here though. Just so you know, this thing goes back 90 plus years tax law. Understood. It's a seller carry back at the foundation. Like you already know this, your CP already knows the seller carry back. Right. We just did a little nuance where we did a specialized installment sale. Okay. Specialized seller carry with this deferred sales trust. And that it's just a slight little shift, but it's the same foundation that you already know. And then we've done thousands of closes. We've already blazed the trail with the IRS. It's, it's already there. So we're not coming to you and say, Hey, Scott, I want you to try this new thing out. Now, 25 years ago, that's what the tax attorney and my business partner were doing. They wanted, and they weren't sure. So the first 10 years, it was just kind of their clients and their own deals. And then like, they're like, Oh my gosh, this works. We've passed the IRS. Now they opened it up. And that's when I learned about it. And that's why we're here today. You know, and, and I guess it's taking that much time to really come to the forefront, to really get to where it's, you know, now it's completely understood. It's something that you can put into practice or have been putting into practice and it's something that you feel very confident in delivering to, to your clients and people that come into your world, right? Um, where do you think it's going to go? Let's, let's push it down five years down the road or 10 years down the road. How big is this going to get and how much of an impact is it going to make on people's lives? Lives. Okay, so right now there's eight billion dollars of caseload. Okay, right now collectively with all the strategic alliances we have across the U.S. All right, and I want to give you a stat. According to the American Bankers Association, there's 17 to 20 trillion dollars of wealth that's going to transfer from the baby boomers to the millennials in the next 20 years, and this is known as the largest wealth transfer in the history of the planet. In fact, there's about 77 million baby boomers in the U.S. alone. And every day, about 10,000 are turning 65. And guess what, Scott? There are parents. And they want to be out of the toilets, the trash, the liability. They want to be able to sell their companies. They want to be able to enjoy their wealth without all the headaches that's associated with owning illiquid assets, okay? And then they also want to defer the tax, which is the 30 to 50% that's going to be wiped out. So they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. Do I sell my high-end primary home? We just did a $3.1 million sale in Cupertino next to Apple headquarters. Above her 121 exclusion, she didn't qualify for the 1031. She used the deferred sales trust. We saved her $400,000. Uh, the deal in Alabama, $2.6 million sale. He actually wanted to develop 80 units of multifamily property. We saved him $600,000 put into the trust and he's using those funds to develop all tax deferred 80 units in Tennessee. So you basically got to look at all of the wealth transfer and all of the things that people are trying to transform or do something different. How are they going to get there? So we think the sky is the limit. It's exponentially gro growing here. Um, and it's, uh, it's huge. Now for the commercial real estate syndicator, how do you, how do you, how do you grow your business? Well, you attract the wealth and you help them unlock the wealth that they couldn't have sold before without paying the tax put it into the trust and then they can put it into your commercial real estate syndicate. And then on the exit, let's say you go to sell your deal. We just did a $20 million deal in Las Vegas for a gentleman, David and Jordan, they're GPs like you. And they, they syndicated this deal and they put their portion 
on the sale. Now the rest of their, their clients pay the tax or their partners because their deals are too small. But for their GP part of it, this is what's cool about the deferred sales trust, just their individual portion can go into the deferred sales trust of their own and they defer the tax. And they said, Brett, this is so amazing. We go to these conferences and no one knows anything about this. Yeah. He goes, we want to partner with you. And he goes, two, we have four other deals we're going to be selling and we're going to move it all into the trust and just keep piling it up. Right. And they're like, this is the best thing before we were just buying, selling, paying the tax and moving on. So we think the sky is the limit. Right. Um, and it's it, and then the next thing would be Joe Biden. Joe Biden's talking about taking away the 1031. Well, if he gets elected here in November and he takes away the 1031, we're not the 1031. We become the number one game in town, in our opinion. And uh, really, really the best the best option at that point. Well, and you're not going to fall into that same category. Right. Because you're not 1031. But you can operate in actually a better space than 1031 so you know correct that's great and we're still a small sliver right we're still a very small sliver and the 1031 has all the attention and there's some other reasons we can go into why we think we're protected there too but you never know i mean they could take away that and then take away that i mean they're running out of money so we can't guarantee anything but in the meantime what we've seen if they do take away something they typically grandfather people in from the past um but we don't think they're going to but uh but either way if you if you if you don't use it you just pay the tax you lost anyway so you might as well do it defer the tax and keep it going Amen to that, you know, and, I, and hopefully I can help spread the word about it, right? That's the point of the podcast. And hopefully, you know, all the listeners that have stuck with us up to this point definitely got a lot out of this podcast and hopefully can put this into action, right? They'll reach out to you at the end of the call. Obviously, all the contact info is going to be in the show notes. And, uh, you know, it, it's an exciting thing. I, I like this uh, idea of putting into a trust and the flexibility that you have that you don't have with the 1031, as we've talked about several times. So I think it's very cool. Um, Brett, we're getting down to, uh, you know, the wire here. Are you ready for a lightning round? I'm ready. All right, man, let's do it. So the first question is, how did your mindset have to change when you, did, when you thought of this idea or put this idea, you didn't think about it, you didn't think of it, but put it into practice. How did you have to change how you think in order to make this a reality? Yeah, great question, right? And because when I first, even sitting at Marcus and Militab, there was 30 other agents that heard the same presentation I did. Yep. And most of them just stuck to the traditional way of doing things and just kind of, you know, either dismissed it or oh, I'll keep it in mind. I was one of the, I was uh, one of, I think one of two who actually like followed up and, and dug in and I got my series 23 and my 63. So I thought about what was possible and I thought about my client and how I could add value. And I said, oh my gosh, this is going to change everything. It might take me 10 years to change it. It might take me a year. Who knows? It's taken me about 10 years to, to get it out there. And so um, I, I didn't let any of those false beliefs or I guess just uh, scarcity mindset. I was open-minded. I was about more of the tortoise in the hair. I mean, it took me, it, it wasn't like overnight I just started using this. Like I vetted it and I, I, I kicked the t can I kicked the tires. I, I asked the tough questions. I kept learning. I sent them referrals. And by them, I mean the tax attorney and now my business partner who's the financial advisor. Then I had the financial advisor manage my own money. So I just didn't let everyone else get in the way, right? I, I really right. believe in what we're doing and how we're transforming uh, people's lives with this. And I've, I've like with resolve, I've just focused on continuing to take one step um, every single day forward. It's the best way to go, man. I mean, it really is. And obviously you're, you're the proof is in the pudding here that, you know, you're putting this into action and helping a lot of people along the way. So, you know, I appreciate that. What are you reading right now? Yeah. So a couple books, um, uh, the seasons of life, besides reading the Bible every day, I'm a Christian. Uh, the seasons of life is a really good one. And it talks about spring, summer, winter, fall, and how we, how, how in life we go through different seasons all the time, whether it be financial, whether it be health, whether it be emotional, whether it be, you know, relational and the world itself is kind of going through a season of winter, right? It's been a really yeah. tough time for America, yeah. for political tension, for racial tension, for economic, uh, you know, things, but we're in the winter, right? And realize that the spring will come. But in the winter, you have an opportunity to clarify what's important to you, what really matters, and how and reflect on what things that you can improve to either be a, be a better person and add more value to people in your business, and then just to grow as an individual. So, The Seasons of Life by Jim Rohn is, is highly recommended. I love the book. Absolutely. I've actually listened to the audio book of that as well, and it is very, very good. It's crazy how Jim Rohn, all of his teachings are still so applicable today. I mean, it's wild. You know, what a great teacher. Um, what are you kind of going on that then? What are you trying to learn specifically? Yeah, what am I trying to learn? Hmm. Um, learn how to work harder yourself than you do on your job, right? So it's, Jim Rohn talks about this all the time. And it's the idea that if you work hard on your, 
your job, you'll make a living and that's fine. But if you work harder on yourself, you'll make a fortune. And, and, and it's, it's a, it's a ever incre increasing. It's not like you learn it one time. Okay. It's, right. it's continually to focus on your growth and your leadership and your health and your finances and your relationship with God and relationship with your spouse, your kids, and also in your career, right? Also on your job, but those are the major areas of your life. And it's a continual process of staying focused on those things. So I'm trying to learn that. I also have five kids and a, and a wife, uh, a beautiful wife who, who's um, amazing. We homeschool. And she, um, uh, she, I'm just learning how to continue to be a good husband, right, and a good father, right, and balance it all with a, a business that's uh, really expanding and growing really fast. So managing my time and my energy. You know, college days, it was more like you're free, you can do whatever you want kind of thing <laughs> in a lot of ways. You get yep. married, you kind of manage your time a little bit. You get your kids and multiple kids, you got to start not only managing your time, but also your energy, right? So practicing meditation, practicing prayer, practicing, you know, uh, working. I've always kind of worked out, so that's kind of been an easier one. But just making sure I'm, I'm sticking to those fundamentals so that I'm in the right emotional and energy state. You certainly have your hands uh, hands full, you know. I mean, you got a lot of stuff going on, and it's good that you're able to navigate through all that and make sure that you have time for all of it, right? And you're expanding not only your business, but also with your family and with your faith and with everything that goes with that. So that's great. What would you say that your superpower would be? Yeah, my superpower, the gift I believe that I've been given by God is the the gift of encouraging and, and, and leading or coaching others, right? And so growing up, I was always sort of the, the, a natural leader and I played basketball and football growing up in high school. Then I played basketball and scholarship in college and, you know, team captain, those kind of things. And, and, uh, and I got the most inspirational award in college and, uh, and, and different things like that. So I've always been able to inspire and encourage people. So I have the gift of, of, of doing that. Uh, and so that's, that would be my superpower. Phenomenal. I, I love that. Um, last question, you know, how can the listeners find you if they want to learn more about the, your business and how they can move money into a trust instead of a 1031, if they want to learn just how to get connected to you, maybe they're in your market there in California, where can they find you? Yeah, the best place would be to go to capitalgainstaxsolutions.com. That's capitalgainstaxsolutions.com. If you're selling a, again, a primary home, cryptocurrency, investment, real estate, you want to back up for your 1031 exchange, uh, private practice, a business, anything like that. Now, if you are a business professional, you're a commercial real estate syndicator, operator, broker, or a high-end luxury realtor, financial advisor, go to experttaxsecrets.com, and we're going to teach you how to use the Deferred Sales Trust to explode your business by adding value. So experttaxsecrets.com for business professional, capital gains tax solutions uh, for owners of highly appreciated assets. Phenomenal. Um, well, we're going to make sure that we'll add that into the show notes. So all you listeners that are you know, listening to this have an area to go to to click on it and find Brett. Uh, obviously, if you're driving, do not click on it right now. Make sure you pull over and do it later so you don't get in a car accident and call me up and say, hey, I'm in the hospital. You owe me a bill. That's not what we're trying to do here. Um, but if you stuck with us, obviously, that means that you love the show. Make sure to like it, subscribe to it, and share it to all your friends so that they, that they get the same value that you got out of it. And Brett, Man, it's been good. I'm, I'm super excited that, you know, you're here to share this strategy with us. I think that it's applicable for a lot of people that are listening to the show and hopefully you'll get, you know, get some reach outs, get some people that they want to want to get involved with you. Thanks, Scott. It's been a real pleasure and I look forward to anyone contacting me. We also have a free ebook too. You can download too on both of those sites. Okay, great. Sounds good. We'll make sure to uh, put that in the show notes and thanks again for being here. We'll talk soon. Yeah.